In my other videos on this channel, I focused mainly on the 6502, so I thought it was about time I showed the Z80 some love, especially for all the ZX Spectrum fans out there. This is a very simple, breadboard-based TTL CPU capable of executing Z80 instructions. If you've ever thought about building your own TTL CPU, I'd encourage you to look at this design. It's very unconventional compared to other TTL CPUs on the internet, and it uses an architecture that a lot of people aren't familiar with. Hopefully I've tweaked your curiosity a little bit. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and press the notification bell to see the upcoming videos. I want to go over the parts I've used for this build. First, there are three 27C 322E proms. These are the largest through-hole EEPROMs I could find. They're arranged as 2 meg by 16, but I'm only using about half the capacity of each device at the moment. I need three of them because I want a 48-bit output. They're located here, here, and here. This particular one's from the bottom left. You can see this is a 100 nanosecond part. Each of the EEPROMs has two octal D-type flip-flops to capture the output. This accounts for 6 from a total of 11 in the build. Here's one of the EEPROMs with its 16 outputs captured by two octal D-type flip-flops. This circuit's replicated another two times. The only difference is the bottom octal D-type flip-flop is a 74HC374 rather than a 273. Collectively, this provides 48 bits of output. All of the flip-flops are connected to a common clock. This means the 48 bits are updated on the positive edge of clock. The next thing you're probably thinking is what do we do with all these bits? Well, 13 of them are fed back into the address lines of the EEPROMs, and this forms a well-known structure in computer science called a finite state automata, or a finite state machine. That's the first part of the puzzle solved. I'm going to take another 8 bits and form this yellow bus here. This also feeds back into the EEPROMs, but it's not part of the next state feedback loop. That's because the EEPROMs only enabled when clock's low, but the 374s only never when clocks high. This means the output of the 374s is never used by the EEPROMs directly. That accounts for six of the octal D-type flip-flops, but what about the other five? Well, the finite state machine we built so far isn't a general purpose computer in its own right. It needs a memory system of some sort, and not just any memory system. For example, adding a stack won't make this into a general purpose computer. But if we allow indirect addressing into a random access memory, it does become a general purpose computer, which is Turing complete. These extra five octal D type flip flops form a set of registers which can provide indirect addressing into a static RAM. The data lines on our static RAM just feed back into our yellow bus. We perform a read from the static RAM when clock's low, and this is when our EEPROM is active. So the EEPROM actually gets 8 bits of addressing directly from the static RAM. That's why we needed to use the 74HC374 on our EEPROM. Basically, so we could turn it off while we're doing the static RAM read. The outputs of the 374 are turned on while clock's high, and it provides the data for a static RAM write. This type of architecture is probably best described as a random access machine. Although, strictly speaking, a random access machine is an abstract model, mainly used for theoretical purposes. The remaining two parts are used to control all of these Octal D type flip flops. The last thing on the build list is the Arduino Mega 2560 up the top. The Mega provides the reset and clock signals as well as power and ground. It also passively snoops on the static RAM by monitoring the address and the data lines. It reads these signals, but it never writes to them. It does this so it can read memory transactions that look like pixel writes into the memory. It then sends this data over the USB to the PC, which then outputs these pixels on this open window here. The Z80 has a huge instruction set, much bigger than the 6502, and I haven't implemented every last instruction. But I have done enough for this demonstration. I haven't cranked up the speed yet, so what you're watching is being displayed at faster than real time. Anyone want to hazard a guess at what it's going to display? Let me know in the comments if you saw this one coming. I've implemented enough Z80 instructions to get to the famous welcome page on the ZX Spectrum.
I'm going to go over the build in the next couple of videos, but if you want to understand the theoretical underpinnings for this machine, I suggest you watch the Pure Turing playlist, link provided. This architecture might be a little challenging at first, especially given its lack of an ALU and a program counter, and some of the other things you normally find in a TTL CPU, but I'm happy to answer any questions in the comments below. That's it for this video, see you in the next one.